But the story doesn't end there. Their numbers grew. They multiplied, not by adding people around them, but by sending people out. And God, who knew their hearts, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit. Because God made no distinction between them, cleansing their hearts by faith. For they were known as Christians. Well, all right, church family, we want to continue worshiping by reading God's word together. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, and I really hope that you do, would you join me in Acts chapter 9? Acts chapter 9. And in just a moment, I'll put it up on the screen so that you can follow along. But we want you to be feasting and reading God's word in your own time the other six days of the week when we're scattered from this place. But we are so glad that you're here. And, and I always challenge everybody to do something with what you have heard. So it may be in the sermon. Uh, in just a moment, when you leave this room, um, if, if you don't do something with what you've heard, if you don't act on it, if you don't pray about it, you'll probably leave that truth right in here. Those songs, so powerful, so moving, there may have been a lyric that's kind of rooted in scripture that as you sung that, you're like, I, I want to believe that about you, Lord. I want to believe that about my life. Let me just strongly encourage you to do something with what you hear and what you experience and what you see today. And so that's why we want you to read the Bible along with any of our communicators that are preaching on the platform. We're in a sermon series in the book of Acts. And so what we have been doing is we've been walking through the book of Acts and looking at the establishment of the, the first church, not just a church, but the first church ever. And one of the things that you're going to see today is how important it is for members or individuals within the church family to open up doors of opportunity for other people in the church. I want you to think about who it was that introduced you to Jesus. Like somebody opened that door for you, right? They told you about Jesus. They said, do you, do you want to follow Jesus? And maybe for some of us, we had a coach or a teacher or a pastor or someone who, uh, a coworker who helped open doors for us to feast on God's word and, and to really, truly enjoy being in relationship with him. You know, when, when I say things like that, I'm super mindful of something that happened for me nine years ago. When we first signed the lease on this property right here, we, we don't own our building. We've just purchased new property. And in the next year, we'll be renovating and building out even more space at, at Ackland Avenue. So that's coming. But, but we do not own this space. And nine years ago, when we signed the lease on this building... I had been reading in Jeremiah where the prophet tells God's people that you should pray for the welfare of the city where you live. And you should do everything you can to help the city where you're planted prosper. Because as that city flourishes, so will you flourish. And so one of the things I did is I looked on Google Maps and I just searched for the nearest Metro Public School from where we're seated right now. And at the time, it was Carter Lawrence Elementary, which is about a mile and a half north of us across Wedgwood off of 12th Avenue. And since then, there's Waverly Belmont and some other schools that have opened up. But, but that was the only one. And I wanted to go tell the, 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 the principal, like, hey, we're, we're a church. There's several hundred of us here. We love God. We love this community. And we want, we want to be an encourager to you. But I knew I had a little bit of a challenge. I don't know if you've ever felt this way. Um, I've been part of churches or I've seen churches that really meant well, but when they showed up at a school, they created more work for the principal than they actually helped. I don't know if there's any educators in the room. You're like, yes, amen there, brother. Like, meant well, but you created something that now I've got to manage once you all go on to your next project. I knew that might be the reputation of churches. And so I just asked for somebody in the community, like, who does this well? There was a woman named Janet Sladen. Somebody said, you got to talk to Janet. She worked for United for Hope, and they said she knows just about every principal in this area. And so Janet set up a meeting where I could go and talk to Dr. Hamilton. And I sat in Dr. Hamilton's office, and I said, like, we just want to be an encourager. We want to be an asset. We don't want to create work for you. And I said, we plan to be here for the long haul. And, and to have Janet and her team pretty much look right back at Dr. Hamilton and be like, yep, I vouch for them. They'll be faithful with this task. What was such a gift and a blessing to have somebody introduce me and advocate on my behalf, right? Everybody needs somebody to introduce them to Jesus. Before somebody meets Jesus, they need somebody to say, this is who he is. This is what it means to follow him. And then once we choose to follow him, everybody needs people in their life pouring into them. And I want you to see a 100% true story from God's word of somebody who was an advocate. They were an encourager. 
And because they did that in the name of Jesus for the joy of the individuals and for the glory of God, the church grew and it even impacts us here today. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do in Acts chapter 9. Normally we stand in honor of God's word. We're going to kind of work through this passage together. So keep your Bibles open and look with me in Acts chapter 9. And I'm going to start reading at the second half of verse 19. And we'll put this up on the screen for you. It says, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. And immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. And what he was proclaiming is that Jesus is the son of God. Now let me pause right there for a moment. If you got your Bible open, keep your journals, keep your notepads right in the margin of your Bible. One of the, the realities that I, that I need to do today is I need to introduce some of us to Saul. Because in our Acts series, we would have hit chapter 9 last week, but, but we paused on that because I wanted to preach from Luke 24 about the empty tomb that first Easter morning. And so one of the things that we really didn't wade into is the conversion experience of a, of a man named Saul. He was a Jewish religious leader. He was super passionate about the Bible and about checking all the boxes of religion. He was what you might call a legalist. I don't know how many of you get fired up about hanging out with legalists. I do not. A little bit of a legalist. I'm going to check the boxes. The way God's pleased with us is if we do enough to earn his favor. And that's what I want you to do too. And so as this Christian faith started spreading from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and other places around the known world, he really was frustrated with this group called the Christ followers, the Christians. And so this guy named Saul was hateful. He was mean. I don't know if you work with anybody that's mean. I don't know if you work with anybody that's hateful. They're just harsh. But, but he took it to the extent that, that he wanted to hurt other humans. It's, it's wrong on any level to be verbally or physically abusive to another human created in the image of God. But he literally, one of the things he had done early in chapter 9 is he was going to make a trip to Damascus, Syria. And he went to the Jerusalem synagogue and he said, can you give me credentials? I, I need credentials from the priest that if I run into any Christians, I have authority to arrest them, to throw them in jail and to do whatever I want with them. That, that's who Saul was. And on his way to Damascus, he had a come to Jesus meeting. That's where that phrase comes from. You ever, you ever had a supervisor say, we, we need to have a come to Jesus meeting? That's where that comes from, Acts chapter 9, where the Lord's voice just speaks out, and there's a blinding light, and it brings Saul to his knees, and the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because when you hurt the church, it hurts the heart of the Lord. He says, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Like, is that, is, that, is that you, Jesus, is pretty much what happens. And I'm paraphrasing from Acts chapter 9. And the Bible says he was blinded, like he couldn't see. And he literally had to be led by the hands into Damascus. And he was so overwhelmed. And like, you, you ever had like a, a, an experience like that where you're like, I'm just processing what happened. You can't eat. He couldn't eat. He didn't drink. He didn't do anything for three days. And he still can't see. And so while he's in Damascus... The Holy Spirit goes to a gentle, humble, meek servant by the name of Ananias. And the Lord tells Ananias, I want you to go to Saul. He's over off a straight street. I want you to go to Saul and I want you to pray for him because I've chosen him as my instrument to take the gospel to the nations. And Ananias does probably what you and I would think. Like, are you, <laughs> you sure about this, Lord? The guy who persecutes Christians, the guy who's mean, the guy who's hateful, you sure about this? And the Lord says, I'm certain about this. And so what we have just read is that Ananias has showed up. Ananias prayed over Saul. And when he did, something like scales fell off of his eyes. I don't know what that looks like, but all of a sudden he could see. And he just, he starts telling people about the Jesus that he met on the road to Damascus. That's what I told you last week. One of the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Jesus is a changed life. And perhaps Saul is one of the most compelling. I told you that I like Peter. Bold and passionate, impulsive, kind of arrogant at times before the resurrection, after that passion is bridled into something that is very purposeful and bold for the faith. Before and after the resurrection, different guy. Same thing with Paul. I, I can't plead with you enough. Just simply live your faith out in the city of Nashville. Like demonstrate that you are a changed person from before you met Jesus till after you met Jesus. One of the most compelling evangelistic resources you have is your story. Just be faithful. 
Just be faithful to grow in community with Jesus, community with other believers, and let your changed life be on display. But don't be surprised if people are a little skeptical, like, I, I knew who you were before Jesus, and you don't go to the bar anymore since you met Jesus, and you don't hang out with us and gossip at the water cooler since you met Jesus. And they may be critical. There's always naysayers. There's always haters, right? There may be worldly people who do that to you, but there may be Christians who are skeptical. What's happening here in this text that we just read, and I'll read it again to you in verse 20. It says, immediately Saul began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. But look at what it says in verse 21. All who heard him were astounded. Like, first of all, this guy loves God. We know of Saul. We know he's religious, like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now he is out there just preaching that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. It's a little confusing. He didn't believe that before. And now he does. Also, like, he's a murderer. He's an arrester. Like, mm, I don't know if we can trust his testimony. All who heard him were astounded, and they said, isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc, wreaking havoc for those who call on the name of Jesus? And didn't he come here in Damascus for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? Now, Paul's not naive. I, I keep calling him Paul because his name changes from Saul to Paul throughout the book of Acts, which is also indicative of a changed life. But, but one of the things that Paul knew intuitively, he means smart guy, very intellectually brilliant guy, like he knew there'd be opposition. He knew people would be skeptical. He knew it'd be an uphill kind of climb into community with other Christians in Damascus. But what did I tell you Ananias did for him? Ananias went to him. Ananias prayed over him. Ananias told others and allowed people to see like God's doing something in this man's life. Ananias opened up doors of opportunity for Saul in Damascus. You see, we all need people to open up doors for us, not only to introduce us to Jesus, but then doors of opportunity. Like, I, I know that God has chosen you for his purposes, and I want to help you be faithful to that, because we need to open up doors for people in the kingdom of God so they can be faithful and pursue what God's called them to do. And that's what Ananias did for Saul when he arrived in Damascus. The people were going to be skeptical, so Ananias vouched for him. He's an advocate. He's an encourager. Dr. John Sowers, who teaches about mentorship among teenagers in North America, says everybody wins when advocates show up. When you get involved in other people's lives, everybody wins. And Ananias decided to get involved out of obedience to the Lord, but when he did... Then Paul was introduced to his ministry, and it begins growing. He opened up doors for him. Now, this week in our home, we talked about opening up doors. I'm not talking about physical doors, but the, the conversation we were having is, as my boys are teenagers, 15 and 17, I assume they knew this, but I felt like I, I wanted to just remind them. I said, hey, listen, this is a reminder. When you ask somebody out on a date, when you ask a young lady out on a date, remember when you go to the truck, open the door for her, open the door for her, close the door for her. When you get out... When you get to the seat at the restaurant, pull the chair out, push the chair back up. If you're seated and somebody walks by and's like, oh, hello, like you're out on a date. You stand up, introduce, hey, this is my friend, so forth and so on. Like open up doors physically, but open up doors relationally out of, out of respect and dignity to your date. Like we, we literally were talking about opening up doors this week at home. I'm sure the boys loved that conversation. They'd rather be playing games or watching TV or whatever. We just talked about what, what a godly man should and hopefully ought to behave like. And one of the realities that I was thinking about after I talked to the boys about how many people opened up doors for other people in the gospel. How many people opened up doors for people as their advocates in the gospel? You got Ananias opening up a door of relationship for Saul in Damascus. And the Bible says that Saul kept preaching and he kept teaching. Look at what it says here. He kept preaching and he kept teaching in verse 22. He grew stronger and he kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And after many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. Now let me just pause right there for just a moment. I'm, I'm pretty sure thou shalt not kill is one of the big ten. Do you realize the anger and the hatred? You don't fit the mold. We didn't choose you. You're switching teams from Judaism to Christianity. Like, we don't read so much in the book of Acts about the Romans wanting to kill Christians as much as 
the, the Jewish people wanting to kill the followers of Jesus. So, so now Saul's in danger for his life. And so what does it say? Verse 24, but Saul learned of their plot. So they, that's the disciples, the church, they were watching the gates day and night. Well, this is the group that was trying to kill him. They were watching the gates day and night to kill him. But here in verse 25, but his disciples, now he went from just Saul in Damascus to now he's got disciples. Now he's got a band of brothers. See how the Christian community should work. Like you don't just need to be a worship only attender when you face your challenges and your battles. I hope nobody's plotting outside the city gates for you, but here's what I will tell you. It's going to be cutthroat in the working world. There's going to be people tomorrow that may supervise you, that they want to, they, they want to work in and through you to accomplish their means. And you can sense it. You can feel I'm just I'm an object, I'm a pawn in this, that discourages me. Like, you're going to run into plenty of challenges that you need your band of brothers, you need your group of women in the, in the spiritual warfare trenches that are praying for you, believing in you. Do you see what's happening in Saul's life? That's why we talk about life groups. That's why we talk about Bible reading groups. Do not do the Christian journey on your own. When we offer those things and encourage you to, take that next step. And so what did these brothers do? How awesome is this? So what did they do? They took him, his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through the opening in the wall of Damascus. Now, I don't know who in here had a bad week. I don't know who in here's had it rough. But if nobody's had to lower you through a basket in the city wall to get you away from people who do not like you, you're good. You're doing okay. Somebody else has always got it worse. Okay? But the brothers help him escape Damascus. Ananias opened the door for him. We need people to open doors for us. Look at what happens when he gets to Jerusalem, because guess what? They doubted him in Damascus. What do you think the people know about him when he gets to Jerusalem? Look at what it says in verse 26. But when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried. He tried to join the disciples, but they were scared. They were afraid of him since they did not believe that he was a true disciple. I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. That was probably like, whoa, the line between faith and trusting God's plan and insanity is razor thin here, Lord. Is this guy really with you? Is he really sincere in his faith? Here's what ought to be encouraging to you. If you make a 180, you repent of your sin, you turn to Jesus, and he starts bringing streams of living water out of you, like he promised the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, and you're like, I have found something that I couldn't find in a bottle, that I couldn't find in the bedroom. I have found something that like my boss can't give me, my parents can't give me, well done, and I still want more. Like I found something in Jesus I've never had before. And you are alive, but there are doubters and naysayers and critical people in your life. It doesn't matter what any of them say as long as Jesus says, he's with me. She's with me. And that's what's happening here. The Lord's like, I got him. I'm advocating for him. I did it on the cross. I'm doing it now. He's with me. The, the Lord Jesus will be your advocate. He will be your defender. You need only trust him. See striving and know that he is God. And when he gets there, guess what? People are skeptical. They're afraid of him. That's what we just read. But they were all afraid of them since they did not believe he was a disciple. Sounds like, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like me nine years ago that needed somebody to vouch for my character, the church's ca character, our intent and our motives. Sounds like he needs somebody like Ananias in Damascus who will vouch for him, who will say, he's with me. You can trust this guy. He's legit. Sounds like he needs yet again somebody to open up another door of opportunity so he can faithfully pursue what God's called him to do. Well, what do you guys know? Look at what it says in the next verse. In verse 27, Barnabas, however, Barnabas, however, took Saul and brought him to the apostles and explained to them, he's advocating to them, he's interceding for Saul. He explained how Saul had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus and how the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus, Saul had spoken boldly about the name of Jesus. Here's yet another advocate, another encourager saying, I believe God's got a plan for this man's life. Let's give him a chance. He's with me. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I was with our pastors last Monday. We get together, all nine campus pastors of our church family. We get together to pray together. We talk about what we see in culture, what breaks our heart, what we're excited about, but we study the word together. And one of the pastors said, I, I believe Barnabas stood up for him as he believed in Paul's potential. 
Well, he's smart and he's sharp and sure if he's turned a corner, like, yeah, he could probably ascend towards influence with the gospel. But like when I heard that comment, I thought, I don't know if it was so much he believed in him. Like this dude murdered Christians. I mean, if Barnabas turns his back on him at a party, he's going to get a shiv in the back. I mean, like, I don't know if he believed in him. As much as Barnabas was in step with the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit said, this is my guy. Because the first time Barnabas shows up, I told you Luke likes to do this. Luke is a name dropper. He is a name dropper. He dropped it in chapter 4. He's like, the church was growing, and they had everything in common. And this dude named Barnabas, who really means son of encouragement, that's what his name meant, he sold property, and he brought the proceeds into the church and gave it to the disciples. And then he don't say nothing about him for about five more chapters until we just read right here. What do we know about Barnabas from what I just told you? He's generous. He parts with his worldly treasures to fund the advancement of the church and the gospel. Okay? I, I'll tell you also what we know about Barnabas. Spoiler alert. If you're like, dude, I was going to read chapter 10 next week and 11 the next week. So spoiler alert. In Acts chapter 11, verse 24, this is how it describes Barnabas. He was a good man. He's full of character. Okay? He was a good man. And he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith full of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, since we live by the Spirit, let's stay in step with the Spirit. The reason we give you a time to pray in the service is if, if nowhere else, if you've been so busy you hadn't made time for God, if nowhere else in this house, tune the ears of your heart to his voice. Barnabas was so into, he was full of the Spirit, which means he was spiritually sensitive. He had eyes to see a kingdom that most of us don't see in our flesh. And he could see, this is God's man. Well, we know that. Ananias was told, this is my man, this is my instrument. Other people knew that. Barnabas, even if he believed in him or was like, I ain't so sure about this, he said, this is, God's got his hand on this guy. And this is God's chosen instrument. I, I think that sometimes there's people within our sphere of influence at your place of work. For those of college students in the room, there's people that are in your sphere of influence that like are just craving Someone to believe in them like Barnabas. Somebody to be their advocate and their encourager and want God's best for them. And sometimes we're not, we're not looking because we're thinking, what do I got to do? I got to get my task done. I gotta, and that's fair, whatever. But like if you took a moment to say today, Lord, who have you put in my sphere of influence? What woman, what man that you want me to invest myself in? For, for me, I mean, I... I have in my home right now two sons and a daughter. Told you some of our conversations we were having this week. That, that's one of the things as I pray, the Lord's like, that's where you start. Your marriage, parenting, those kind of things. So maybe, maybe that's helpful to you if you think through. Maybe if you have a sweet mate and you're coming up on the end of the semester and you're like, yeah, honestly, I have no idea where my sweet mates are spiritually. I have no idea what they believe. I'd love for them to know Jesus. And what if you share Jesus with them and they're like, yeah, I've been following Jesus since you know, 2005. Great. No harm, no foul. Like, but are you sensitive to people around you that need to be introduced to Jesus? And so I'm going to drop a challenge on you this week. Who is it this week you're going to introduce to Jesus? We ask ourselves as a staff, who are you, who's discipling you? I need somebody pouring into me. I have pastors that pour into me. I have lay leaders that are 10 to 15 years older than me that pour into me. And they ask me hard questions. Like we always ask, who's pouring into you first? Because none of us are beyond that. But who are you discipling? Who are you pouring into? And that's my question for you this week. Who is it that you want to invest in? Who is it that you want to be an encourager and want God's best for them? Because I'm going to tell you something. Barnabas was not only generous, he was spiritually sensitive the Bible says later in the book of Acts that like there was a fam he's hanging out in the church in Antioch. They hear there's going to be a famine in Jerusalem and they collect an offering. They send relief to the church in Jerusalem and they tell Barnabas, you take it because we trust you with money. You're trustworthy. You're a man of character. You're full of the spirit. You're an encourager. You're an advocate. Like what a dude. As I read Acts, I'm like, that's my boy. Like I love this guy. When I was growing up, I was like, I want to be like Paul. I want to be like Peter. I want to be like the dudes that you read about that's like, that's the rock stars of the faith. Here's what I absolutely love about our brother Barnabas. He wasn't fancy. Barnabas wasn't even fantastic. Barnabas was just faithful. 
Barnabas wasn't fantastic in any sense. In Acts 13, we hear that he and Paul were commissioned to advance the gospel and the church in Antioch sent them out. So we know that at some point he literally had some sort of platform to preach from. So he's a public figure in a small sense, perhaps. But for the rest of the time, he's behind the scenes. He's behind the scenes saying, I want you to reach your kingdom potential. I want this man, this woman, I, I want the church to grow. I want the church to be healthy. And so he advocated for others. I, I mean, this is pretty cool. You know how Barnabas probably got saved? Most scholars believe it was from Peter's sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2 or shortly thereafter. Somebody saying, I want you to know Jesus. I want to introduce you to Jesus. Can I introduce you to Jesus? I, I mean, like Barnabas is a product of people wanting God's best for him, Right? And now he's wanting God's best for others. Many scholars believe Barnabas wrote Hebrews. You ever read Hebrews? You ever get anything out of it? You might want to thank our brother when you meet him in glory. Like pretty significant guy, but in our flesh and in our cultural perspective, we, um, no, like give me Esther, give me Ruth, give me, give me Peter or Paul. No. Don't worry about being fantastic or fancy in the kingdom. Just be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Open up doors for other people. The people, I could, I could list the people who've opened up doors for me in ministry, personally, coaches, mentors, pastors. Open up doors for people. Just be faithful. Every Sunday morning when I get here, Don Howell's making coffee. Don Howell's making coffee, and you may not know Don, but he's here every Sunday making coffee. But when you get here and you're like, where is instant human in a cup? I need it so bad. Like, where is it? You love Don. You may not know Don. Please. I'm ready to worship today. Like, Don's here all the time. During the week, over my eight years, I've, I've watched preschool and children's teachers slip in here on a Monday or a Tuesday when there's nobody but the staff and set up their classroom. It ain't fancy. It ain't fantastic, but it's faithful. And God changes the world through people who just want to be faithful to him. And the fun part of it is, in the same way, there's been men that are in our Brentwood Baptist system that have opened doors for me, Jay Strother, Mike Glenn, so many others. I, I take great joy watching the doors open for other guys like Hunter and Truett and Alex Rose and ministers on our staff like there's great joy in that. Be faithful and for his glory, and he gives us the joy of having a front row seat to watch people's lives flourish professionally, personally, all of the above. I'll go back and ask you again, who this week are you going to open a door up for? Who? Guys, if you're going out on a date, open the door to the car, but that's not what I'm talking about. Who are you going to open the door for? There's somebody God's entrusted within your sphere of influence. Open your eyes, ask for eyes like Barnabas, and just start investing in them. Be an encourager when everybody else is just grinding on them. Pray for them. In, in, in your prayer closet or where you pray when nobody's looking, pray, God, I want your best. I want this woman, this man to know who they are in Christ, to find their identity in you. I, I do pray that they're successful in career and relationships, but I want them to flourish with you. Open doors for people this week. History's changed by people that aren't fantastic or fancy in the kingdom, but they're just faithful, right? And if I was like, surprise, we've got a guest. Barnabas is here today. Barnabas, come on up here. If he were here, you know what I bet he'd say? I just want to tell you all about Jesus. I just want to tell you about Jesus. That's what he would do. So open doors for people to find Jesus. Be their encourager. Be their advocate. Because the Bible says in verse 31 that as a result of Paul's faithfulness, as a result of Ananias' faithfulness, as a result of Barnabas' faithfulness, the church in Jerusalem and Galilee and Judea grew again and again and again. God will grow his church for his glory, but through faithful people in his kingdom. I'm going to pray that you have the courage to do something with that this week. Let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute.
Nick and the worship team are going to come back up here to the platform. But you may want to keep your journal open, and you may want to write down what it is you need to do. So when I'm talking about who, who are you going to open doors for, who are you going to be an advocate for, like you may want to write down their name. Write down their name. I'm going to pray for John. I'm going to pray for Meredith. I'm going to pray for Ben. I'm going to pray for Allison. Like you may want to write down their name and you be faithful when nobody's watching because that's how God grows and builds his kingdom. It's often behind the scenes. You know why? You know why I'm confident of that? Because that's the way of Jesus. Jesus didn't want the spotlight. He just wanted to be faithful. You, you may need courage for that. I, I know that not all of us are good or perhaps feel confident in initiating conversations. How, how do I do that intentionally? If you need courage, ask Jesus for it. If you need, Lord, you're going to have to manufacture an, an, an open crack in that door for me to walk through. Ask him for it. If whatever it is you need so that you can share the gospel with others and help other people reach their kingdom potential, whatever it is that you need to get there, ask him for it. Don't leave here and not have what you need because you didn't ask Jesus for it. Let me give you about 60 seconds where Nick's softly playing on the guitar. It's just you and Jesus. You ask him for what it is you need. And then we'll stand and sing in response in a moment. <laughs>